There come people. Okay. Give it about a minute for the numbers to go up a little bit. For those of you joining the room, welcome. Hey, Devin. See, it's a little community here. As soon as the participant number slows down a little bit. All right, we're about to stay. All right, welcome to our third Sports Business Classroom CBA webinar, everybody. As you know, my name is Larry Kuhn. I'm the GM of Sports Business Classroom, and I am the instructor of CBA Mastery On Demand, ironically with Larry Kuhn. This is brought to you by CBA On Demand, as well as Hall Pass Media. We have guests, as usual. Um, I have with me, uh, wearing the same shirt I am, Eric Pincus. Uh, he is one of the instructors at Sports Business Classroom. He is also with Bleacher Report, Basketball Insiders. Uh, you see him on NBA TV. You kind of see him everywhere. Anywhere somebody wants to talk basketball, he's more than happy to oblige. Um, he is also doing his own YouTube streams. Check it out because it gets very topical um, and very thorough with a lot of information. He's on Twitter. He's at Eric Pincus. How are you doing, Eric? I'm doing quite well. I'm, I'm enjoying the preseason already. I'm ready for some basketball. Let's go. Preseason already, isn't it? Yes. Um, also with us for the first time on these, we have Bobby Marks. You've seen him on ESPN, everywhere on ESPN. Um, he's also the former assistant general manager of the Brooklyn and one time New, New Jersey Nets. Um, and he's also been a contributor to Sports Business Classroom. How are you doing, Bobby? I'm good, Larry. How are you, hey, Eric? Good to be here. Yeah, we're doing great. This is these have been really successful. We've you know get a lot of great feedback on these. Um, we get you know a lot of great content. We can look at it more from a financial and CBA and analytical standpoint, which is which is kind of nice. So we like to get some good expertise here, and especially with your front office experience, that's really going to come in handy uh, for some of this discussion. So before we get kind of to the content, I do wanted uh, I do did want to talk a little bit about CBA mastery because that's the whole reason we're here. If you don't already know, you're not already subscribed, this is an on-demand course for learning the collective bargaining agreement. It is my curriculum for learning the collective bargaining agreement. I've taught it over and over. I taught it to directly to NBA teams. I've taught it to agents. I've taught it as the GM of Sports Business Classroom multiple times. And now it's available in an on-demand video format. And I even get deeper in that than I do when I, I teach it live globally. You can go to sportsbusinessclassroom.com for more details or to sign up. We will talk about it a little bit later in the show and stay tuned because you probably figured out we will have a special offer for you guys. Uh, stay tuned for the end of the show. So um, here, here's what we're gonna do. You know, Each time we've done this, we've kind of been topical. Okay, they, they have the agreement. Let's get on and do a webinar. We were uh, getting closer to the season. Some signings are happening. Let's do a webinar on that. Well, now the season's about to start. We're in preseason, abbreviated as it is, and we're getting going. So what I wanna do is look back at some of the deals that have taken place since the previous webinar, some of them very recent and maybe some other things that are of interest as we get closer and closer to opening day. So when we get to what I call a teachable moment, um, I'll stop and we'll talk about the rules that govern what happens. So you'll get a little bit of teaching, a little bit of commentary, a little bit of BSing between all of us. We will also take some questions at the end. Um, if you don't know, and hopefully you do, we did send out a request for questions 
by email. So we got all those in advance. In advance, I was able to curate them, look for the shortest ones, hint, hint. <laughs> and I have a few that are, I'm already set to answer. So I'm most likely not going to do any by the chat today because I've already got a list right here. So uh, Real Games, December 22nd, we are like almost there. Um, 72 game season. So we've had preseason games. Um, what have you guys seen so, seen so far, Eric? Well, uh, I mean, the big question, of course, is how can they get it done without a bubble? And so far, it's too early to say. I mean, they're, they're not going to do a bubble. They're doing a lot of testing. They're, they've got an extensive safety protocol. But we're also living in a world where it doesn't matter how much you prepare. Uh, there's a certain amount of uh, life happening. And so uh, I'm hopeful that they get through it. Uh, the play so far has been great. We had teams that have been off since March. And then, of course, I cover out of Los Angeles, the Lakers, and they've only been off for like two weeks, it feels like. So uh, it's been fun to watch just a little bit. Uh, I'm looking forward to the season starting. It's a bit of a jumble because I'm still trying to make sense of who's on what team. Uh, I'm sure Bobby has that, <laughs> that feeling as well. It, it's, it's still I, I've almost got it figured out now. I just have a couple of teams to go through still. But uh, it, it's a, I'm, I'm glad basketball is back. That's that's basically the, the main point. I'm, I'm happy it's back. What do you think, Bobby? Yeah, I mean, for me, I think, Larry, it's the rookies, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's they were drafted three weeks ago. Their heads are probably spinning still. Um, we've seen some great play, uh, Lamelo Ball, you know, some of the, the, his uh, passing wizardry, um, Isaac Okoro in Cleveland. Um, but I think it's going to be – we're going to have to play the, the waiting game on these players because they didn't have a whole summer of training and being with the team and being in Las Vegas, July, August, this is really their October right now. Um, if we were looking at a regular season here. So um, if you look back on the 2011 draft class that came out post lockout, um, a lot of those guys fell on some hard times because of the condensed season and, and with a limited training camp. So um, for me, I think it's just to keep an eye on where, how, what rookies kind of separate themselves, right? Maybe you'll see probably more of the uh, seasoned players, the OB Toppin in New York, who's, you know, was in school for three or four years and as one of the older, um, one of the older rookies here. But that for me is probably what I'm probably keeping an eye on, at least for the first couple, first couple weeks here. Now you have some experience with this from a front office perspective perspective so after you draft a player right he's his whole life changes in the span of you know from june until october when he's got a report to camp and now it's just got to be worse i mean what what do you see the the draft rookies going through after having just been drafted like day before yesterday it seems like yeah, I mean, it's funny. Usually, that you know, the draft would happen that late in June, that Thursday, and you'd have that press conference either Friday or even that Monday. When whenever they would come in, we'd always tell the parents, "Well, now they're ours. You know, he's ours, right? Now you you've had him for the last couple months, but now he's he'll be here. Uh, we'll we'll start um, mini camp, and then we go into into um, summer league." Um, we'll be in you know Vegas for 10 days or 14 days. Maybe he'll have a week off and then back. And then he's the players there for the whole month of August, September. And then we start training camp late September, early, um, early October. That is not, that wasn't the case. I mean, the draft was, you know, mid, mid November, he maybe had a day or two and then training camp started, you know, 10 days later. So it's just a lot for them to digest. Then you have to also factor in all the logistical part of it. Like, where am I going to live? Right. Mm -hmm. I got a new city. Um, we're dealing with COVID right now, the testing protocol. Not, it's not like the player can just roll in and have a workout and go four and four in the beginning stages. It was, um, you know, it was all individual workouts. So do you see certain rookies being more affected by this and really being put at a disadvantage? Well, I mean, yeah. I think you already saw in Golden State with, you know, with James Wiseman um, that, you know, I think from a medical standpoint, um, you know, missed a couple, uh, at least I think the beginning part of training camp and it's probably a little bit of behind the eight ball as far as getting on the, on the, um, on the court. And for a guy who hasn't played since what, November, you know, kind of five on five, um, you know, he might be a little bit, you know, as I said, behind the eight ball. Yeah. And Eric, I wanted to ask you about a second year player. I have three words for you, Taylor Horton Tucker. <laughs> what's going, what's going on with him? 
Uh, well, uh, so when, when the Lakers drafted Taylor Horton Tucker, uh, I had asked somebody uh, with the team, was this just a favor for Rich Paul, who is LeBron's agent, and are they just taking care? And they said uh, that they had Taylor Horton Tucker as a first rounder. So hmm. they had a chance to buy a pick and get him, I think, at 46 or somewhere around there. Uh, that They jumped it at it. And that he was part of clutch was part of it, but that's not the reason why they went and got that pick. They were really high on him. He had some uh, injuries, and then he had some, I guess – personal issues that he was dealing with in college that set him back. And so if you could look past that and see what he was dating back to high school and how unique he is as a shooting guard, who's got like a seven foot wingspan, uh, they're really excited about him. And I had heard back in the bubble, like the coaches, especially like the assistants were just, we have to get him on the court. We have to get him on the court. They snuck him in a little bit in the rocket series just to, get him a right. taste and he played pretty, you know, he was composed and he's got a very uh, like a herky jerky kind of game. He's it's hard to quite um, pinpoint, but he, his maturity as a player, just that his, his, his ability to see and not rush to go fast. He kind of, he's not a fast, fast player. So he's kind of, he's going quickly and slow at the same time, which if you know, basketball, that's kind of the key is to move quickly, but not rush. And uh, I, I have a ton of, people asking me, what does this mean for the Lakers in the future? And we're not going to get into it today here. I, I plan on doing a video on it or a stream on it on YouTube. Uh, what are the rights? What, what can the Lakers do now that he'll be a free agent after the season? And uh, that gets into the restricted free agency question and arenas rule and all of that. So I'll touch on that in the future, but uh, the Lakers are going to have to find a way to make room for this kid in their rotation. We're going to have to do a whole webinar just on the Gilbert Arenas provision, <laughs> just because it takes me an hour to really explain it well. All right. So let's, let's kind of move on. I do want to talk about some of the recent transactions that have happened. The one I had last is the one we should probably talk about first, but I'll still go in the order that I had them. So Paul George, right, locked in with the Clippers, a veteran extension. So four new years on top of the contract, um, which is the most that they can go, $190 million. He has a player option in 2024. Now he was at a situation where he was already a 10 year vet. So his max was already the biggest max it could be. Um, so getting him the maximum was, was pretty easy, but this does bring up a teachable moment and we'll see how good the control room here is getting Yes, they are. They are great as always. So I do want to talk about maximum salaries a little bit. So, you know, there, there is the most a player can make and league wide, you know, it varies and it, it depends on your years of service. The older you are, the veterans have a higher maximum than the younger players. So it, it's always based on whatever the cap is. So if you're a player with, who's a rookie up to six years of experience, your maximum is 25% of the salary cap. So $100 million cap, your max is $25 million. So now we're a little bit north of that. So we're, the max for them is a little bit north of $25 million. Once you have seven years of experience, the max goes up to 30% of the cap. So again, it gets higher. Once you're a 10 year vet, then that's the highest the maximum can go. 10 years or more of service in the league, your maximum is 35% of the cap. Now that's the league wide maximum. There's an exception for individual players. If you're coming off of a salary that was already higher than the maximum, you're a, a Westbrook or a, a James Harden and you're coming off of a contract that's paying you 45, $50 million, you don't have to take a significant pay cut to the maximum. You're already an above max player. So individually, a player can always sign for a 5% raise over what they made in their, when they came off their previous contract, even if that's above the league-wide maximum. So we call it the league-wide maximum and the personal maximum. You get the greater of those two. Now, maximum salaries apply only to the first year of a contract or of an extension. So you can get raises after that. And raises could be five per, up to 5% or 8%, depending on the kind of free agent you were. Um, so you can keep going above the maximum in the second, third, fourth year of a contract. It's just that first year of a contract or an extension that has to fit within that maximum. The other thing to be aware of is that whole threshold, zero to six, seven to nine, or 10 plus, it can, there can be some exceptions to that. Certain players can qualify early for that next level maximum. For a rookie extension, 
certain people who's who are extending their their rookie contract so starting in their fifth year they can already qualify for that seven to nine year maximum and for veterans you know we call it the super max although super max means a few other things after eight or nine years and this is the honest situation you qualify early for the 10-year veteran maximum now you got to meet criteria in order to do that they just can't throw these contracts to anybody so you've got to have been the MVP in one of the most recent um, seasons, um, or you have to be all NBA or defensive player of the year, either this past year or the two years prior to that. But those certain players under those certain circumstances can bump up their maximum a little bit early. And back to us. Thank you, Max. So where do they go from here? What do the Clippers do? Because they're, in, I don't think they're, that great of a you know there's there's certainly a contender i don't see them getting over the hump with the lakers certainly and you know they've got um a Kawhi to contend with you know they i've even seen people saying that they might not even keep paul george where do they go from mm -hmm. here well i'll jump in on here i cover them up pretty closely and so they can't trade Paul George for some time. They technically can trade him this season. We don't know when the trade deadline will be, but I believe there'll be a little window where they might be able to trade him this year. I don't know if they extended him to trade him. I, I, that, that's something we'll have to wait and see. The, the big question is Kawhi Leonard. And now that Giannis, spoiler alert, that's something we'll get to a little later, is off the board. You start to reshuffle the list. There have been teams who have been lining up to go after Giannis for some time. Now, who do you go after? And you start to make that list. And who's the top guy after Giannis? And we could debate that, but it might be Kawhi. And so, you know, th this is a good team. They don't have a lot of future assets as far as uh, draft picks. They don't have a lot of young players, uh, like top recent picks, like the Lakers had Brandon Ingram and uh, other young players to trade out uh, uh, ball and whatever, whoever they got for it, sent for AD. They don't have that. I mean, Terrence Mann, Fiondu Cabangeli, these are like the young guys. So, there's not a lot. I like Daniel Oturu, but these aren't guys who are necessarily going to be uh, bringing you a all-star in return. So maybe trading Lou Williams in the last year of his contract, how much does that return? So you're, you're sort, sort of in a difficult spot. Now, if Kawhi leaves, they'll have a certain amount of cap room potentially, but that's not the goal. You know what I mean? The goal is to keep him. So I don't know the answer here. I, I will say one little wrinkle, you know, on Paul George's, uh, he was eligible for a, an extension of up to 120%. That's the max you can get as an extension, but he's still limited by that max of what the max will be. So what he's actually signed for is that 120% max, which is, uh, I have it at 43 million roughly, but the number that it will actually be is not determined. And we won't know that until the time comes and then we'll go by the, the what we saw on your chart. Right now it's projected to be about 39 Point three million in that range but for the first time ever we know what the maximum will be because they agree that the cap would only rise by a maximum of 10 percent. Right. so we, we know really can put a cap on it <laughs> we know the, the the cap will raise three percent to ten percent that was something that's been uh, artificially put in to deal with our recent epidemic so uh, we know the range of what paul george will make but we won't know his salary until then so uh but same with like lebron james same thing they signed bigger deals and it's really up to the cap to grow. And it, it, it's, it's only going to go up so high, right? Uh, I don't think it'll climb the 10% max, but uh, that no. remains to be seen. Yeah. What do you think, Bobby? Yeah. Are, I mean, are, do they have enough? I don't think so, Larry. I, I mean, I think I have them as the fourth or fifth best team in the, in the Western Conference right now behind the Lakers, Portland, um, Utah, and Denver. I, I think that's where I, you know, I, last year I had them going in as number two. Uh, I, I'm my big concern with that group is their bench. Um, I call it the X factor. When you look at Reggie Jackson, Luke Kennard, Nick Batum, uh, Patrick Patterson, uh, and, and now they've got Zubak coming off the bench. Cause I think they, they said they want to start Serge Bach at center. Um, that's probably my biggest, um, my biggest concern with that, uh, roster as far as how I think they're a really good team, but do they have another gear, right? To kind of, you know, do they have that winner mentality to kind of kick in? I think we know Kawhi does. I'm not sure about Paul George. Yeah. And he, he's going to be interesting because, um, you know, that is what happens if they flame out first round. There's no guarantee that team's getting out of the first round. 
Uh, he, his trade eligible date is, I think, April 9th. Probably will be after the trade deadline. But if I am the Clippers and this doesn't work again, there's, you know, you're not hanging up the phone as far as when somebody calls you. Yeah, one thing that I always thought the Clippers, you know, historically have just been sorely in the need of over the last few years is good halftime adjustments. So they they did make the change from Doc Rivers to Ty Lu. I mean, how big of a difference is that going to make? Well, it's just kind of you're moving one guy a seat close, and one guy who's in the second seat over to the first seat right now. And we've seen most of the time we, we've seen the big change happen in season, right? that coach gets let go. The interim comes in, you get like, you know, we had it in New Jersey when Lawrence Frank took over for, um, for, um, for Byron Scott. I mean, we went like 16 and 0. we ran off a bunch of games. PJ did it in uh, with, with uh, Avery Johnson in 2012. Now this is a little bit different because now it's a, it's a, a fresh start condensed training camp, basically the same roster returns. But my big thing is I want to see if there, is there a hangover from that, that, um, that Denver series. That's yeah, going to be no the kidding. big thing. How much of, and their schedule to start is not very uh, hard. I mean, not very easy. I think they've got the Lakers, Dallas is in there. Um, so it's, it's going to be in Denver too. So it's going to be, a, it's going to be a challenge kind of right off the bat. Yeah, I agree. It'll be interesting to watch. Let's talk about Anthony Davis and then LeBron after that. So again, another re-signing, uh, this time as a free agent, not as an extension. So he became a free agent and then re-signed five years, $190 million. He did start at the max. So at his, in his case, $32.7 million, 30% of the cap. He was an eight-year vet. So it wasn't the, the 10 year vet max. And in fact, he did have the option of signing, let's say a two plus one deal, two years plus an option year. He would in theory opt out after his 10th season and then re-sign at the 10 year vet max. And then he would over the lifetime of his career be able to make more. Of course, there's a trade-off for that in that you're not locking in as much long-term money as possible. Um, so Eric, you think, you, you think he, he made the right decision just locking it in, I'm sure. I, I do. I, how can I tell somebody they made the wrong decision when they sign a $190 million contract? I mean, it's nuts. What are we talking about here? Uh, now you could try to maximize and maybe he could have milked out an extra, I, I computed it before, maybe it was, if it was 40 million more, 36, I forget the exact number now. Uh, but at the time I computed it there. Yeah, he left money on the table, but he would have had to take a shorter deal, less guaranteed money. And we're in a world with uh, beyond the what we're dealing with on the court, which is, you know, players get hurt and you have devastating injuries. But we have a worldwide crisis like lock in one hundred and ninety million dollars. How do you not do that? I, I get like there's you can live your life where you want to get every cent that you could possibly get. And I've personally found just in my life that sometimes when you're going for every single penny that you lose out, you lose sight of something and you end up hurting yourself more. So I, I don't, he is not going to be, he's going to be taking care of his family for generations. Well-deserved. He's one of the best players in the league. He's you know, from my experience being around him, not a ton, but enough that, you know, I enjoy his personality. I think highly of him as a person. So I'm happy for his success. Uh, the Lakers are happy to have done this. I know that they had their eye on free agency the next year and, and the, the possibilities of, getting maybe making a run at Giannis. Uh, but LeBron wanted his money. He got paid. Anthony Davis wanted his money. He got paid. And that took the Lakers out of that mix. How do you blame, if you're the Lakers, are you going to be crying because you've got Anthony Davis for five years and you can't also get, you, you can't be so greedy in life. That's, I think, the, the main thing. So I'm happy for Anthony Davis. It's, to me, it's the right move. Yeah, the team obviously wants to lock him in as long as possible, but that does create the potential for one of those dead money situations where you have a guy who, who you know, God forbid, does have a devastating injury, and then you're locked into money that you're really not going to recoup through performance. How big of an issue do you think that is, Bobby? Well, I mean, I think for from, from Davis' perspective that he took the – the safe route as far as the insurance. And I think he looked at it as an eight year window, Larry, where he, I know he could have been, um, you know, 10 year plus vet um, in 2022 and be able to hit 35% of the cap. But I think the cap's still going to be somewhat at a, at a flat number. There'll be a gradual increase, but the, the revenue is still going to be not kind of where it once was. Um, and he's looking at it. Hey, let me lock in that four years. And then 
I'm going to be 32. Hopefully I'm still healthy and playing at a high level. And maybe there's another, as I call it, bite, at, bite on the, uh, bite on the apple, but you know how, how history goes is that these max contracts, when they get towards the tail end, right? Years three and four, we're talking about like, Whoa, man, that contract doesn't look as great as it did, you know, two weeks ago. Um, it's like Chris Paul, right? We went through mm -hmm. this with, with, uh, with Chris Paul, where Chris Paul, um, a year ago or two years ago, we called that a toxic contract because Chris was injured. He was, you know, he's dealing with hamstring, knee injuries. And now, like this past offseason, Chris Paul's valuable again, right? Maybe we'll be talking about John Wall two years from now. But yeah, those max contracts. And I think Anthony's a little bit different because he's still in the prime of his career. Um, usually people, you get rewarded for what you did in the past compared to what the future holds. But I think with, with AD, um, he's not a 33 or 34 year old signing that max deal. He's still, you know, 27, 28 years old. I mean, he's yeah, still you young. made, you made a great point that I didn't think of at first, which is it's the locker contract is also a hedge against any possibility that the league revenues go down in the future. And he might not be able to sign that kind of a deal uh, three years from now, even. That's a good point. But let's talk about the other half of this dynamic duel. So LeBron James, uh, so he had a, he was signed for this year. He had an option um, after that. So they ended up tearing up the option and then adding, you know, two additional years after that. So he, he signed three years, $85.7 million. Uh, he got an ETO, I saw, which I thought no, was, that was. No, that's. AD has the ETO. AD, AD, oh, the ETO. AD got the ETO? I thought it was LeBron got the ETO. You got to have it on the fifth year. Yes, right true. I, 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 think I, I think I looked at that one. Or I just wrote it wrong on my notes here. But yeah, AD got an ETO. We don't, we don't see many of those anymore. They're an early termination option, like a player option, but it's more of a historical artifact and almost nobody has them anymore. So I'm not going to teach on those, but I just did think it was interesting. But Braun, you're right. He got a player option, not an ETO. Um, now he could not sign a longer extension, even what well, he could have, but it would have been of no value to him to sign a longer extension, even if he wanted to. And that's because of the over 38 rule. So let me teach on that for just a moment here. And then we'll kind of go back and, and discuss. So there is a loophole. Um, if you were a clever GM, you, you could have thought of this way back in the past where you have an older guy, he's valuable, you want to keep him, but he's kind of near retiring. Maybe he wants to play another three years and then he's got to retire. Okay, you're going to play three years, we'll sign you to five. It's guaranteed. You, you play those three years, you retire, we're paying you for five years. We're throwing addition, two years of additional money at you that no other team's going to throw at you. So come sign with us. That's the kind of thing that they wanted to prevent. Intentionally signing a guy just so you can keep paying him for more years after you're pretty sure the guy's going to be retired anyways. So the over 38 rule closes that loophole. And interestingly, as player health and, and everything else progresses, the, the age at which it takes effect has gotten later and later. In the last CBA, it was the over 36 rule. And a long time ago, it was the over 35 rule. So now they're saying, okay, players can normally play till 38, which is great. So what it does is if you have a longer contract, and we're talking a four year or more contract, and it's, it's going to cross so that a season starts after the player's 38th birthday, then it could be considered an over 38 contract. And it's interesting spelling if they're furred there. Um, the, the later seasons of the contract, they reclassify the salary as deferred salary. And that's important because deferred salary, any salary can be deferred, which is mean that puts the payment schedule after May 1st of the following season. Any contract can be can have salary that's deferred, but an over 38 contract, they say these whole years are classified as deferred salary. That's important because deferred salary is charged to the salary cap in the year that it's earned, not in the year that it's paid. So they're saying these later years are deferred salary. We're gonna take that aggregate total and we're gonna charge it to the first years of the contract instead of those latter years. 
So rather than signing for $10 million, let's say, they consider the first year charge to be, you know, could be 15 million or whatever, just be by the way that the math works. Now, it's fine if, if it's a smaller contract and you're way below the cap or way within an exception. But if you gave a player all of an exception or he's at the maximum or it's all of your cap room, then that could be an issue because now with this deferred salary added on, you can't fit the guy into that maximum or cap room or exception. So what do you have to do? You have to reduce the salary for this year to fit that charge in. So they both fit together. And the way the math works is pretty clever. Um, it ends up, let's say it's, it's a four-year contract where that fourth year gets charged to the first three years and you have to reduce it in order to fit. You end up getting paid total across the contract the same over those four years as you would have been paid if you had just signed a three-year contract and gotten the normal payment for those three years. So it, it doesn't eliminate, that's one of the common things that people don't realize with an over 38 contract. It doesn't eliminate four-year contracts or even five-year contracts. It just says, you ain't gonna get paid any more than if you had just gone ahead and signed for three years. Uh, a couple of other things about that is that um, as you continue to kind of prove the assumption wrong and, and you do play into those later years, they do start to rebalance things. So the, you don't get a zero cap amount for the fourth year or the fifth year in an over 38 contract. They start to smooth it out. So you still get a cap amount for those last years. It's a pretty interesting rule, a, a pretty weird way that they ended up making it so that it removed the incentive and eliminated the loophole, but it's part of the league. And LeBron James fell under that this year. So you saw that he signed for three years. He didn't sign for any more than that. All right, so. Yeah, Larry, and, and PJ Tucker is gonna be one of those guys too. He's in that over 38 family that, um, you know, he's looking for that extension and he would be limited to certain years because of where his age is. Right, I agreed. So, okay. Back to the Lakers, because I know, Eric, it's his, it's his favorite topic. So I mean, That's my, my area of coverage, you know, in L.A. Uh, well, you know, it's, it, it's certainly a successful duo. So, what, I mean, the guy will be 38, right? I mean, is this going to be his last contract? Is, do, what do you, do you think he's going to keep going? Is he going to, you know, be in the, the first player in the league at the same time as his son? Uh, I mean, that's the game plan, right? I mean, I, I is, is it? I mean, people speculate that, but is it? Have I sat in front of LeBron and he told me that? No, but I mean, I, re reading between the lines, reading some interviews that he's talked about, it would be a dream come true kind of comments. And look, his son is still what he's a sophomore in high school. He's got a ways to go. We don't know if the league is the, the league had discussed getting rid of that requirement that you go to college, the one and done rule, uh, and let players come directly out. There's some debate whether that will happen. And I think the you know the pandemic sort of may, may have shelved some of that or at least delayed it. Uh, so I don't know if there's a lot of momentum. So it's still unclear what year exactly that Bronny, LeBron James Jr. Jr. will be a draft eligible. And then, of course, he has to uh, develop and prove to be NBA caliber, though, if you if you draft LeBron James Jr., even if he's not very good, but his you know, his father's going to come to your team no matter what. And even if that means he has to take the minimum to do so or the mid level, then you draft LeBron James Jr. And I know LeBron will be older. Uh, at that point but you know, other than the groin injury last year he he looked pretty good this this past season right so uh it, it's it's a good deal for the lakers it's it's two more years so he had they really only added on one more year because he had a player option so by voiding that player option they replaced that year he got a slight raise like a hundred thousand dollar raise in the first year next year and then they added on one more year and if you look closely at CBA FAQ, Larry's FAQ, LeBron can't get an option in that last year because you, if you're adding on a year, it can't be an option year. So he has two additional years now. So really they added on one more season. And at that point, the Lakers can keep him. He can stay as long as he wants, as long as he's healthy. I'm sure they'll pay him. Remember, he's a huge draw in the box office. And I know that we can't go to games right now, uh, but he's a huge television draw. Uh, and remember, the Lakers paid Kobe Bryant after he had torn his Achilles uh, into the sunset. And so, uh, you know, it's a history. It's a, an organization with a history of taking care of their superstars. 
And I think in part, I don't think that's why LeBron came to the Lakers, but I think it played a part in that, the way they treated Kobe out the door and how LeBron wants to be treated down the stretch of his career. That makes a lot of sense. So last night when I wrote up the notes for this webinar, you know, one of them was on Giannis and just said, yeah, let's talk about what, what he's waiting for and what might happen. And then he goes and, and, and signs a super max extension. So um, if you didn't hear the news, I'm happy to be the one that break, to break it to you. Um, Giannis will be in Milwaukee for the foreseeable future. He did sign one of those super max deals that I talked about. So he's locked in five years, $228 million. He's got an option in that last year. So, you know, I was gonna ask, okay, has Milwaukee done enough to keep him or what else do they need to do? But now let's talk about the other teams. So. Uh, you know, obviously Miami seemed to be one of those teams that was really lining up to try to, to, to get them, you know, who else do you think really lost out here, Bobby? And, and what's the, the, what's plan B here? Yeah. I mean, I think the two teams that stand out are Dallas, right. As far as um, they had the ability to, to create a max slot. If, um, Josh Richardson opted out of his contract or didn't opt into his contract. Um, you know, they would have been close to around 32, $33 million. And then certainly how Toronto has lined up their books with the Aaron Baines contract, Alex Len, um, how they started with Fred Van Vliet and the, the number declines in year two. Mm -hmm. um, they were in position to potentially have a max slot, but based on if, Two things, if Norm Powell uh, did not opt in, and, and the second was if they don't extend OG Ananobi by the rookie extension deadline on December 21st. So I think those two teams were, I don't want to say lose out the most, but had positioned themselves to go out and, and make a pitch to him if he became uh, available. Miami's, Miami's fascinating just because they kind of hedged their bet with um, the, yeah. the team options on Avery Bradley and Goran Dragic and Myers Leonard, where like, if they know that they're not going to get one of these big fishes, I would say, then maybe the option is picked up and they roll back that team. Um, I, and then I thought kind of Miami, yeah, I thought they were great at that because you know, they, they realize, you know, Eric likes to say, you know, at best, at best, the deal is 50%. You can't count on it being more probable than that. So for something a year out, being able to say, you know, sort of like, okay, we're casting our net with, with, uh, with Giannis and if we don't get him, we're screwed. Well, they're not screwed. So I think that was a great way of, as you said, hedging your bets. So what's plan B, Bobby? Well, I think if you're plan B, who's that next disgruntled all-star that becomes available from a trade standpoint, I think, do any of these teams have the enough assets regarding, we'll probably talk about James Harden. We'll see what happens with Bradley Beal um, a year from now. I don't think Beal's going anywhere or um, until next, you know, they'll make a decision next off season. The right. free agent class for 21, Larry is, has taken a hit. <laughs> it really has with <laughs> you know, certainly LeBron on the board, Giannis, um, you know, uh, Paul George, uh, the restricted, free agents, Tatum, Adebayo, Mitchell, Fox. And now we're looking at, you know, does Victor Oladipo revert to his all-star form pre-injury? Um, some of the free agents have big numbers for their player options. The Blake Griffins, the Chris Pauls. Um, that's, you know, that's the, the group of guys is not as great as it once maybe was on paper. And I always said, we always had to put a uh, somewhat of an asterisk next to that, um, to that to, to that group there yeah you make a good point in a year of maybe some financial uncertainty and and otherwise uncertainty of, of reasonably sized player options looking a lot better than it might have looked in previous years let's kind of move on let's, let's talk about we we talked about the signings and uh, extensions let's talk about some of the trades a little bit because there's there's a couple that um couple of deals that did happen I wanted to talk about. And Bobby already mentioned one player that I do want to explore a little bit where a deal might happen. So um, Russ Westbrook, John Wall, we had a one for one deal there. So except the Wizards had to throw in a lottery protected 2023 pick and there's cascading protections on that. And it um, goes to 2026 and then it converts to two seconds. So that's a common thing for teams to be able to do. But 
it, it's kind of a case of, you know, those big contracts and Bobby, you use toxic contracts, which is a great term for it. Wow. You know, if they get toxic there, they get hard to trade. So certain, you know, they used to say, oh, this guy's untradeable. Well, there's no contract that's untradeable in the league, but some of them get pretty tough to trade. And I think these are cases for different reasons, um, but they just got traded for each other. So it's not like it was, you know, that big of a thing. Both players had about, you know, had three years left at about the same total amount of money, player options. So, um, you know, it was a deal that was available and both were trying to, to kind of see what they can find, obviously. But I do want to talk about this concept of trade equity a little bit. And Bobby, I want your perspective on this. How do you kind of find that point of, of equity where, okay, you know the major pieces, but how do you figure out, okay, what's gonna, what else is going to get thrown in here to make the, the scales balance? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you, you have a, what you have, Larry, is a checklist of things that if you are trading um, a, a for a Russell Westbrook and you are have to take back the, a little bit of the uncertainty of John Wall, just because John hadn't played since December of um, 2018 in a regular season game. Okay. What else can I get with it? You know, I'm not going to get, you know, here's my checklist future first. All right. What are, what are the protections? Um, do we know that if that pick will actually carry over, is it maybe the draft rights to a player? Is it maybe a young player who's, you know, we talked about uh, Erica talked about um, town Horton Tucker. Is there a young player on a second round uh, contract? Um, who maybe hasn't played that much and that we've seen him play in the G league and we want him in as a, as a throw in because, you know, we think he could develop a year from now. So I think you just kind of go through your, your checklist of draft assets, young player rights to a player, potentially. Um, the interesting thing with the Westbrook wall trade, it was probably the quickest trade call that the league office has had <laughs> during this, this period, because it was a straight one for one, right. two players, basically, the identical same contract um i think that i think the the um that came out at like 6 30 and by eight o'clock the league had already sent out the memo <laughs> so <laughs> that rarely does not happen in, in that regards there the biggest part of that trade call was probably just making sure they had the protections down in that draft pick yep you're right interesting um the other trade i wanted to talk about was was the hayward trade um and this is a case where it was a sign and trade. He went to Charlotte and came back for, you know, kind of nothing really. So both sides sort of threw in um, second round draft pick assets. It's one of those cases of balancing the trade the right way. Um, and Boston was going to lose him anyway. So it was just a case of, well, let's get what we can get out of it. And what they got out of it was a great asset, you know, even if it's not a tangible asset right now, and that was a trade exception. So I do want to teach on trade exceptions really quickly. Max comes right through. So one thing, I mean, you hear trade exceptions talked about all the time. One thing to realize the CBA, you search for trade exception, you ain't gonna find it. It's not a defined thing in the CBA. It's not a tangible thing. The CBA has what's called the traded player exception, but that's the entire like 10 page rule that says how players can get traded over the cap in general anyways. That's not what we're talking about here. So. The first thing to realize is that there's two kinds of trade, simultaneous and non-simultaneous. Simultaneous, as the name suggests, you get less time. You got to do it all at once, but you get more money. You can take back more salary than you bring in. A non-simultaneous trade is sort of the converse of that. You get less money to deal with. You can only take back up to what you sent out. You can't take back more than you sent out, but you do get a year to complete the trade. Now that year to complete the trade is an interesting twist because for one year, it's like you have a department store gift card with a one year expiration date. You can keep going back to the department store and spending and, on, and buying stuff and charging it to that gift card until one of two things happens. The balance runs out or that expiration date passes. Once that happens, you can't keep spending on it. A non-simultaneous trade kind of works the same way. You send out a guy, you take back less, whatever that difference is. And in this case, since draft picks count zero in trade math, they sent out 
Hayward's entire salary and took back zero, they got a trade exception for the entire amount of his salary. They can keep signing or trading for, well, they're not signing, they can keep trading for guys and charge them to the Hayward trade up until a year from now or until they exhaust that salary. There's a couple of other restrictions with that. One of them is you can't aggregate, which means there's one guy going out, you can't add salaries together in order to, to make a trade to bring back a more expensive player that you couldn't acquire uh, for one of those guys by themselves. But if it's one guy going out or a guy going out without aggregation, then you can get a trade exception as long as you're bringing back less money. You know, if, it was, if the guy was making $10,000 less, big whoop, you get a $10,000 trade exception, you can't use it on anything. But what we see here is the opposite end of that spectrum. We see, I think the biggest trade exception that we ever had so let, let's, let's kind of talk about, well, first of all, is this the biggest trade exception ever? Eric, you'd know that. Yeah, I think it is. And what's interesting is that the Celtics can't use it yet, or they can't use the full balance because they have a hard cap. And I think we'll talk about that at some point today. Uh, and so they do have the ability to trade for almost anybody in the league. But as you said, there's no aggregation. It's, it's like a gift card. You can't put two gift cards together. Uh, if someone makes too much, there's nothing you can do about it, right? Uh, and so, yes, they could bring in a $28 million, whatever the exact number is, $28 million player. It's $28.5 $28. million, rather. And so, you know, the challenge is, is that they can't use it yet, but their hard cap will expire before the trade exception will. So this may be a tool that they use next free agency. Uh, it expires on November 29th. Uh, we'll have some time to, uh, we're still, the calendar's still a mess. We don't know exactly what's going to happen as far as the timing of next year, but they should have time after this season to bring in a, a big, big player, or they could bring in someone making 15 uh, because they do have some room. They have about 14, I think under the, let's see, they're at about 118. So yeah, they've got about 20 million. So they can use some, but they can't use all of it. And they have a packed roster. Uh, but if there's an opportunity, they can trade away pieces if they need to. So they could trade some players to reduce their salary, to give them more room. But that kind of defeats the purpose of what you're using a trade exception for. So there's there's a lot that Danny Ainge has to work with with this, this tool. Yeah, I thought that the Giannis signing really hurt Boston because of that. Because as you mentioned, they're going to get the free agency before the trade exception runs out. And had Giannis become a free agent, I could see Boston going, you need to clear cap room. Come over here. Let's talk. <laughs> well, you know, that's that's trade exceptions are extremely valuable. The, the Grizzlies have they lost a lot of them, but they had like at some point eight or nine or something. Hollinger was collecting them. <laughs> it's something it's something that you you can use to facilitate trades. And, and so you like the Hawks made they use their cap room, the Knicks, the Pistons, some of these teams used cap room. Uh, but if you don't have cap room, you have trade exceptions. And, and if we look over at Oklahoma City, they're another team that has a, uh, a plethora. I don't have them in front of me, but they have a ton of trade exceptions as well. They got one. Uh, gosh, I mean, they have something for Steven Adams, which is massive. They, they've done a, they've played that game. And what it does is it just puts you in any conversation. And it, you don't have to be the primary team to be making, okay, you're getting a superstar or whatever. You could be the team that's getting uh, cast offs, but those cast offs might be the, the reason why you win a title, especially if you're a team like the Celtics with championship aspirations, right? It's not like uh, the Pistons where they're just trying to rebuild. They'll be able to use this tool potentially or the Thunder with their massive trade exceptions to add on to this core of what they're trying to do. The Thunder rebuild and win. I think they're sort of in the middle. They're trying, they're not trying to tank, uh, but the Celtics, they're right at the door in their mind, I think, of, of winning a title. So if there's an opportunity before the deadline, even if they're not using the full 28 million or whatever, maybe it's a $10 million player. Maybe there's someone they can add uh, around the trade deadline that pushes them over the top. Yeah. Hey, we're doing what I usually do, which is we talk more than I think we're going to talk. <laughs> so um, just really quickly, um, James Harden trade obviously hasn't happened yet. So how likely is it he's going to get moved? Yeah, I think if it's anything, Larry, it would be probably after February 6th. Uh, when, and that's when the, most of the free agents restrictions are lifted. Um, and that just kind of opens up the player pool. You know, March 3rd is the other date for those, those free agents, those bird or early bird for 20% of their, you know, signing. Um, 
I don't think when you have a guy who's got three years left and you're Houston, I think eventually he does get moved, but I don't think you're, you're rushed to do anything kind of right off the bat here. See where your roster is. I always said that the hunt, the off season is the honeymoon period. Everybody loves their roster until you're 10 and 10 and end of <laughs> January. And if you're Brooklyn and you're struggling, or if you're Philadelphia and you're struggling and maybe right now you only want to give up one first round pick with Ben Simmons, maybe that becomes two or three. So I think for Houston, it's kind of be a little bit of a waiting out period. Yeah. That yeah. makes a lot of sense. I, I, I'll just say on, on Houston, there is so he has a long contract uh james harden does right so this is he has two seasons this season then the next and then he has an option so they do have the time at the same time james harden somehow video leaking of him at a club instead of training camp there are ways of making it very uncomfortable so i think there's going to be tremendous pressure to get him moved and at the same time they have to be strong enough to wait for the right deal I do think Houston, based on who they are and, and their history, they, they're, they, they're no longer run by Daryl Morey. Uh, but I think the people who are now running uh, the Rockets have a lot of his, um, you know, philosophies. And I think they'll take their time. I think Bobby's right in that there is no rush, but there is that pressure. It has to be resolved. And I think it gets resolved with a trade. But it doesn't have to be in December. It can be by March or whenever, April, whenever we end up with the trade deadline. Yeah. Um, I want to move on to the hard cap. I'm, Max, I am going to kind of skip the teachable moment just so we can move along a little bit more uh, expeditiously. And we have talked about the hard cap before. I did it as a teachable moment last time. Just remember, if you do certain certain exceptions, certain system mechanisms are reserved only for low spending teams. If you're a high spending team, you can't use them. If you're a low spending team, you're committing to staying a low spending team, which means if you use one of those things, you can't go above a certain threshold. That threshold is called the apron and it functions as a hard cap, meaning you do certain things, you can't go anywhere above that line no matter what happens. So Bobby, I did want to talk to you about, you know, which teams are, are affected by the hard cap this year and how, how they're affected. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've, we're at a record number. I think we're close to 20 teams that are hard cap, certainly some um, like Atlanta will not, will not come close to the apron because of um, you know, them acquiring Gallinari and that sign and trade. But four teams to, to keep an eye on. Houston is one of them. They are only a million dollars below the, the hard cap right now. They're going to have to stay at 14 players. They basically have six players competing for four, for four jobs. When you look at Gerald Green and Jerry and Grant, players like that. Uh, the two teams in L.A., the battle of the hard cap with the Clippers, uh, because they use the surge um, Arbaca on the uh, on the full mid level, they're only five hundred thirty eight thousand below the hard cap here. So there is no wiggle room for them to sign a player until you know sometime I think maybe March or April to add a fifteenth player. The Lakers are at two point five below the hard cap. That number actually goes down about nine hundred thousand once Quinn Cook is on that roster for the regular season. Um, and then the last team is Giannis's team, Milwaukee. Um, you know, the using the um, most of the middle level on DJ Augustin and Bobby Portis, 441,000 below the hard cap with 14 players. So those teams have no margin for injuries. Luckily that you'll be able to utilize two way players this year. But yeah, this is um, this is rare. Last year we had Golden State in Miami because of the Jimmy Butler signing trade, the D'Angelo Russell signing trade really kind of tow that hard cap. But this year we've got four, Larry. I, I know. And it's, it's kind of weird because, okay, in the early days of the hard cap, team, some teams didn't really understand it. I mean, I saw some teams just function beautifully as soon as the hard cap was implemented. They, they figured out some teams just kind of ran into it like it was a brick wall and it was, it was scary to watch. Uh, you know, we, we talk about, well, do you hard cap or do you not hard cap? And, and obviously if you're too close to it, it could be a real danger, but like Eric, what, do you, what have you seen where uh, uh, that would be the deciding factor on a team doing it? It's just a compelling enough deal to be made. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, it, what are you, what are you getting in return for limiting your spending power? Right. So if you can get a good player at a mid-level exception in, in the case of Serge Ibaka, that was the player that the Clippers felt 
would be the ideal fit for them. For the Lakers to get Montrezl Harrell, who's on clutch, and gives them a totally different dimension, that was enough of a reason. Uh, sometimes you look at teams, and you, I, you said historically, like the Clippers were one of the first teams to really run into a problem. And they did a hard cap right off the bat when the rules came out and ultimately traded Jared Dudley and a first rounder because they couldn't even field a full team for training right. camp. So uh, I, I think teams are more experienced by now. I mean, you would hope and have a better understanding. It's really about what are you giving up? Uh, it, it was too good of an opportunity for those particular teams, Clippers and, and Lakers. And, and obviously the, you know, the Bucks are doing any, any move that they make that gets Giannis to sign was a good move. Of course. And every move they've ever made <laughs> is now justified up to this point because Giannis is staying. So we can nitpick that they might have done it, me messed up here or there. It doesn't matter. Um, ultimately, the hard cap is, is fine. You just have to wait a little bit. For instance, if Bobby mentioned if they keep Quinn Cook uh, and let's say they want to add Pau Gasol to finish out his career, they can't do it till February. So you wait till February. Pau's not even ready yet anyway. So uh, for the Clippers, again, same kind of thing. In the hardened trade, if it if it does happen, they're going to have to take back less salary. And it, if they do so, that's not that hard because it's hard to match a salary like James Harden's anyway. Uh, so these are just factors that good teams, you would hope, are prepared to deal with and are cognizant of the money. And I think for the most part, that's true. Although sometimes you look at what the teams are doing and you scratch your head and say, I don't, I don't get it. And we'll, we'll, we'll leave those unmentioned today. Yeah. So I want to start to move on and kind of wrap up the whole, you know, off season, preseason. So just to kind of cause see where we are now, Bobby, you don't know this, but sort of in my family, when we're sitting around the dinner table, my life, my wife likes to do a thing she calls, you know, peak and pitch. It's basically everybody around the table, just, just as a conversation starter. Well, what was the peak of your day? What was the pit of your day? The best and worst things that happened to you in that day. So in, in that spirit, what, what was the peak for you for, for the preseason and the recent deals? Yeah, I really like what Portland did. I mean, I think whatever, everything from getting Robert Covington in the trade to uh, bringing Carmelo back, Rodney Hood, Ennis Cantor, Derek Jones Jr. I think, Larry, this year, depth is going to be key for a 72-game season that is condensed in, what, five months. And I like, I like how, the, how the Trailblazers, with – not with cap space, right? They did it through the trades. They did it through the mid-level. Um, they kind of patched together and put a, get, put together a, um, a pretty good bench. So that, that was my, um, that was my, uh, my peak. Do you want my pit? Too? Oh yeah. To my, uh, I didn't like anything Detroit did. <laughs> How's yeah. that sound? From the Mason Plumley contract, three years, 25. I know that third year is only partially guaranteed. Uh, Jeremy Grant, three for 60 basically trading away, I think at a minimum three second round picks and Luke Kennard to the Clippers. Um, Isaiah Stewart, getting him in the teens. I think he could have probably been in the, in the twenties there. Um, Josh Jackson for the room exception. So I think they, uh, as I said, they used, they had, it was basically, basically giving your wife the credit card to go out shopping and they, and they used it all up in, you know, their cap space in, in 24 hours here. So I was not a fan of uh, what the Pistons did there. Yeah. What about you, Eric? Well, I mean, I think the peak is today's news that Giannis is staying. And it's not that, you know, I'm a Bucks fan or anything. I'm a fan of the game, but it's for the league itself. The, the concepts that they put in to give home teams the chance to keep their stars, especially in smaller markets, is designed just for that so that they will have their homegrown absolute MVPs stick around for longer. So it's a win for the NBA itself to have Giannis stick around in a small market uh, on a very long-term deal. And it, it, there's, there's been a lot of question of whether the Supermax is, is working or is it not working. In some cases it is, in some situations it's not. Here's a, a huge win for the NBA itself. Uh, Pitt, I, I don't fully understand the, the major investment in Gordon Hayward, especially subsequently stretching out the contract of Nicholas Batum where you're functionally paying Hayward 40 million a year. Or if, if you don't look at that way, you're, you've got 9 million of dead money on your books for multiple years. And I like Hayward as a player. I don't know about uh, where that team is, where he is as an age in his age bracket, and then 
overcoming injury and I, and I wish him well, and I hope he's able to fully return to his, his heights and that it's a success. Uh, but I don't really understand where that team is and where that investment is financially. It doesn't, doesn't really add up. Yeah. So Eric, you stole my thunder for the peak. I was going to mention the, the Giannis Supermax, you know, it, what a great thing for Milwaukee that they were, you know, it's a small market team able to hold on to a transcendent star like that. My pit, I think is the current James Harden situation. That's just, you know, these situations don't end well. It's not good for Houston. It's, it's not good for him. You know, it's going to resolve itself, um, eventually but you know we have one of the great stars in the league where this is just going to continue to follow him around and be a distraction until it ends and probably for some time after that so that for me is my pit so i do want to move on uh bobby you've you've seen cba mastery right i have yeah so uh, you know i and i want to leave some time for audience questions but before we do i do want to talk a little bit about cba mastery and remember i, I said there's going to be a special offer so you're on this webinar so i know that you're interested in the business side of basketball and many of you because i see this every year at sports business classroom have a goal to work in the league be in the front office be an agent be be whatever um, or even just be a better fan, understand, be an armchair GM, understand the business side of basketball better. So as I said, I've been teaching this for a long time. I developed the FAQ first to document it, then I developed curriculum and started teaching it all over the place. And now uh, what I'm doing is I took that curriculum and we recorded an entire on-demand video uh, series to teach you the CBA. So, and this is, it's currently available. It's 11 and a half hours of video content spread across 23 videos. Eric helped to review them. So I know he knows how thorough th this was. Uh, they're, they're, each exercise, I mean, each video comes with exercises, quizzes, you know, um, references back to the CBA that it comes with key terms to find. So you really have a self-paced curriculum that's really going to teach you the CBA at a level where, you know, you, you walk into a front office and, and you've got this material down cold, you are going to be you know, in the game as far as the CBA is concerned. And we also throw some more stuff in with that. So there's, in addition to the final exam and our certificate that, yeah, you've done this. Um, we have a forum for questions and discussions. Um, in addition to that, we also provide access to VSL talent, which is think of it like a LinkedIn for basketball where employers associated with the league and around the league use VSL talent to find people. Um, we provide, um, if you sign up for CBA Mastery, we also provide access to the videos from the this year's sports business classroom. It was virtual this year. It was a huge success. We have it all on video. We provide access to those videos. So if you're interested, you go to sportsbusinessclassroom.com. You'll see information there for CBA Mastery. Click in there to sign up. And here's the special offer. Because you're here listening to us, you're here interested in, in learning more, knowing more, we're going to give you a special offer for three days. So through Friday, we're going to give you 10% off. If you want to sign up, you use the promo code XMAS10, so Christmas 10. Um, or if you're doing the payment plan, you can pay over three payments. Use the code XMAS10PP. And I'm sure Max is going to put that up there um, pretty quickly. So use one of those codes. Use them by Friday night, and you will be able to get CBA Mastery for 10% off. Um, And in, again, 60 hours of video content with the, the, um, the curriculum for Sports Business Classroom Virtual. I mean, we had me, Eric on there. Bobby, you weren't, you, you've been with us at CBA um, at SBC in Vegas, but you weren't there for us um, for the virtual conference. But we did have Mike D'Antoni with Kurt Goldsberry, Neil O'Shea, Gillian Zucker, the president of the Clippers. We had Tommy Shepard, the GM 
of Washington. We had Mark Jones from EBM, ESPN in Sacramento, Nate Duncan, who I'm sure many of you people know. So that alone is, is just great content to have. So once again, go to sportsbusinessclassroom.com, click on CBA Mastery, use code Xmas10 or Xmas10 PP for the payment plan um, if, if you want to sign up. So I do want to hit a couple of questions. We asked the audience to provide them for us ahead of time, which was great because I had a chance to review and, and filter on the short ones. So I do want to hit a couple of these. I am going to switch to my glasses. Um, so Andrew's asking, um, no, I'm sorry, I'm not that one. Um, so Charles asking, should the definition of BRI be expanded to include indirect revenue streams, i.e. Dan Gilbert's casino next to Quicken Loan or Loans Arena. So the way that income works is that um, basketball related income includes income from what's called a related entity. And a related entity, I'll take off my glasses so I'm not showing my own screen in my eyes. Uh, a related entity is any business that is co-owned, you know, that, that the, the team ownership owns, has at least a 50% interest in. And then the amount of interest from that revenue um, source counts as basketball related income in proportion to that amount of ownership. So the canonical case of this is a team has its own cable network and does the TV deal. Well, they sell the broadcast rights, you know, to the team for, you know, I don't know, a billion dollars a year. And now the team has no income. Hey, you know, this is great from a BRI standpoint. Well, they thought of that. If you own a related business or even an unrelated business, then um, that business's income also gets, gets included under certain circumstances. So um, Charles, they already thought of that. Um, Charles also asked, would you be in favor of an amnesty provision? Uh, why wouldn't the Players Association push for one to open up dead cap space and also allowing that player to be paid and move on to a more desirable destination? You know, th this thing gets talked about a lot and they do do it from time to time. When, they, when a new CBA significantly changes the luxury tax rules, they usually throw in an amnesty provision because you're, you've, you signed a player under one set of rules and now we change the rules. But I mean, we've had conversations about this. Why wouldn't they just do an amnesty provision as a general thing, guys? Well, the, I'll say that the issue is, is it's more money that's being paid out and the league isn't necessarily a fan of more money being paid out. Uh, ultimately, the system works where the players in the the league, they're splitting the money, the BRI, roughly 50-50. And it's a very delicate system that could easily be thrown out of whack. And if you have a $20 million, $30 million contract that's now being amnestied and now the team's able to spend another $30 million, I'm using a you know hypothetical, that might throw the balance out of whack. And so ultimately, the it, that's it's exactly what you described, Larry. It's to fix uh, a, a system-wide change. And it shouldn't be something that allows teams that have more money than others to just rip up bad contracts because they made a bad mistake. Why should the team that has more money just be more willing and more able to, to do that when it's maybe a team that doesn't have the same kind of income can't afford to rip up a $30 million contract, something like that, and then to spend another 30 million just because they can. Yeah, and I mean, in the big picture, uh, you know, the player's still going to make his money, even if he's amnestied. You know, it, it doesn't affect the amount, the paycheck the player gets. It affects the salary cap hit. But what that means is that you're ostensibly freeing up salary cap dollars to go spend on another player. Well, when that happens, like Eric mentioned, there's an agreement. They basically split the revenue 50-50. And in fact, we can figure out how much collectively the teams make to the dime. You know, across all the players. So if a player is able to get a bigger contract, it means the rest of the players in the league are going to be getting a little bit less. And it's, it's the balance, like we said. So the union may not be in favor of something that's going to, you know, help one player if it hurts everybody else in the league. Uh -huh. Do you think that that's a fair assessment, Bobby? Yeah. And I think, Larry, too, is that there's no bad contracts really anymore, right? We went through that wave of 2016 of when the cap spiked, um, you know, things have settled. Uh, as you said, the, 
the amnesty was in the 2011 CBA because there was the rules that changed drastically. I mean, we used it in New Jersey on Travis Outlaw, um, but as you, we still had to pay. Uh, actually, Outlaw was actually an amnesty claim. That's probably a discussion for another day how that works. Um, but we still had to pay most of um, you know most of that uh, the salary. I think the the wave and stretch provision kind of has made kind of like the brokered a deal there where you can stretch the payment uh, over, you know, either three years or five years, you know, maybe some, sometimes seven years uh, where you take less of a cap hit. So that's kind of your middle ground to where that amnesty provision is. That makes sense. Um, I'm going to try and move through some of these others pretty quickly. And I, I did get your questions. If I don't get to them here on the air, I will go back and do them via email because I, um, Number one, I think that Hall Pass committed me to that, <laughs> but also you were kind enough to send me your questions. I'm going to at least give you the courtesy of making sure I answer them. Um, uh, Nate here asks, I'm going to skip to a second question. What areas would you recommend to really focus on to bring value to a front office in a G League team? And I'm going to do my brief answer to that. Um, and then I'm, I want to turn it to Bobby since he has direct experience here. So my brief answer on that is, okay, there are, cap specialists. There are guys who specialize in certain areas of basketball. There are guys who, who um, have, have really have that area of, of expertise in a certain area, including the CBA. That's great. And you want to be able to sit down at that, at that table in the war room at the draft or when you're doing planning sessions or, or whatever, and be able to contribute to a conversation like that. The best way to be able to do that is to have a broad base of knowledge and be able to connect those things together. How does this deal work from a cap perspective and from a training perspective and every perspective? Put the pieces together and be able to, you know, analytical perspective, things like that, uh, and be able to provide input in, in the broad spectrum of areas. What do you have to say, Bobby? I would say for, for me, Larry, it's, it's video. You know, if, if how you're going to bring value or how you're going to get it, your foot in the door or start up is video, you know, providing edits, you know, starting on a kind of that bottom level. I mean, we've all done it who work for teams. We've sat in a room and we've cut up video for our coaches either on draft prospects or G league prospects. And, and I think that brings value because you're that person who's going to see them up front. So when the director of scouting asks you, Hey, what do you think about John Smith? Shoot. I've just watched 20 hours on him and I've cut up tape on him. Maybe it's a little bit different now, not cutting up tape back then it was cutting up mm -hmm. tape. But I think, I think from a video aspect, that kind of brings a lot of value um, as far as film, you know, familiarity with the prospects. Yeah, I remember taking a tour through one of the team's front offices and uh, we got to the video room and um, the, the person kind of pointed at that chair and said, yeah, half the GMs in the league sat here at one point or another. <laughs> it, it, it really is, is, is true and that's a great point. Um, I'm gonna do two more, two more questions. Um, one of them, Henry, Long-term contracts have built-in raises, e.g. 8% for the max, that don't necessarily grow with the pool, which hamstrings teams in later years of the contract. Is this viewed as a problem by the NBA? And yeah, my, my first comment to that is you think it's a problem now. A few years ago, the max was 20% raises and it was even worse. So they, they have reduced the raises over over time but yeah if if the cap grows by like four percent a year salaries that grow by like eight percent per year be become a greater proportion of the of the of the cap um over time and that can get out of whack eventually what do you think can we hit the sweet spot there at, at eight four percent for most of them um or i'm sorry five percent for most of them eight percent for a few of them is is that where we want to be I think we're at a, a reasonable, the, the CBA more or less projects like four and a half percent climb in, in BRI every year. And so if most contracts are 5%, that's in line with that more or less, but we're sort of in a awkward time, right? So uh, the CBA was not designed for the world we live in today. And that's where we've had the union and the league come together and compromise to the best of their ability. So uh, there's, there's no real way out of this other than getting through it and dealing with the consequences under normal circumstances. I think five to 8% uh, 
you're paying players to stay uh, your own players with bird rights or early bird rights, you're giving 8% raises. There should be an, an incentive for those players to stay with the teams that they're with. That's, that's kind of the point that's, that touches on our topic with, with Giannis it, super max aside uh, the league wants team. They want teams to keep their homegrown talent as best possible, at least to give those players additive in, incentive. And, and it, it may not match up with the growth of, of, uh, of BRI and the growth of the cap, but you're, you're being, I don't want to say penalized, but you're on the team side. If you are spending more to keep your own guys that you've developed, there's a cost to that. And so you are going to be limited in your ability. I think we're the system as it is, is generally working. There are obviously areas that we could spend hours and hours discussing that aren't. Uh, or that aren't as, as good. In this area, I don't think it's as significant. It may just be more pronounced right now because of the world we live in. And that's not really anyone's fault. That's just what we're, we're forced to deal with. Yeah, that makes sense. I want to do one more question before I let everybody go. I'm kind of near the end of my grace period here. So um, what part of a GM's job is underappreciated by fans? We seem to dissect capology and player development, but what should we pay more attention to when assessing a GM? Bobby, I'm going to send this one to you. Managing people. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably the biggest thing that's uh, underappreciated is that the great GMs hire people that have specialties and let them do their work. And you kind of serve as that CEO that oversees it. And you are the one who makes the final decision based on what everybody does the information that you get from the people that you hire. I think that's probably one of the things that gets probably overlooked the most. Yeah. What do you think, Eric? No, I mean, that's, that's the hardest part is people management. We're all, uh, none of us are perfect human beings. Right. Uh, and so you're dealing with hurting cats sometimes, and there are people with cross motivations. And you're also, I think Bobby would attest to this. You're dealing with, uh, ownership groups that uh, people who uh, maybe don't know basketball, who have a very strong opinion about the, where the direction the team should go, that may not match what the basketball department views as realistic or right. And so, yes, people management, that's not just managing down, it's managing up to uh, people who have probably made a lot of money in their lives and are, are confident in their decision making and think that it translates to basketball when it, it, it simply may not. Yeah. And one of the things that may not be visible to, you know, fans and, and stuff is, you know, one question I've, I've, I've had several friends who've been, you know, assistant GMs or other front office people and later on took that last step to, and became the GM. And after a period of time, I like to always ask them, so what do you know now that you didn't know then from, from, from all your previous experience? And uh, a lot of the time the answer comes back, uh, the political nature of this position, and, and you've kind of nailed it there, Eric, is, is you're dealing with ownership who has you know, certain demands and you're, you're balancing a lot of factors that you wouldn't have thought that you had to, to balance. And because you're, you're the one who's dealing with the ownership um, or you're the one who's dealing with certain things that the rest of the front office is, and that's, uh, at the front of your plate and nobody else's. So that's the answer that always came back when I asked them that question. All right, so I'm going to wrap it up here since we are running a little bit behind as usual, but it's, it's been a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Bobby, I hope you're gonna come back because I thought it was, it was great, it, um, a great dialogue here. You provide a lot of great information. Eric, as always, you know, I, I can never seem to get away from you. Whatever <laughs> I seem to do, you seem to be right there. Uh, but always love the conversations. Uh, Eric will pick up the conversation on his YouTube streams. I am, I am certain. When's your next one? Uh, I, I think I need to do something on Taylor Horton Tucker. Uh, if not a stream, maybe a 10-minute video to sort of explain the arenas rule. If it can be explained in 10 minutes, uh, it might take two hours to explain. It <laughs> I tried. I can't. <laughs> you you got to you got to take an hour to do the Gilbert Arenas provision justice. That's just my that that's my my rule and I'm sticking to it. All right. So once again, remember go to sportsbusinessclassroom.com. Click on CVA Mastery to register. Use code Xmas10 if you're paying in one payment. Use Xmas10PP if you're 
doing the payment plan, do it by the end of the day Friday because this offer will disappear. Uh, this webinar was brought to you by Sports Business Classroom and Hall Pass Media. Thank you to Max in the control room, Jordan for the graphics, everybody else there for all your work and support. So on behalf of Bobby, Eric, and myself, thank you for watching and we will see you at the next one of these. All right, guys. Well, um, I think they just drop off slowly, but thank you again. I really appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Larry. Thought it was Thanks, Larry. Really Bobby, well. always good to see you, man. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Eric. You too. Good seeing you. All right, All right Bobby. I'll right. see you. See ya.